Good evening and welcome to this webinar entitled A Moment of Dishonor, Racism, Sewell and the Christian Response. My name is Richard Reddy and I'm the Director of Justice and Include Churches Together in Britain and Ireland or CTBI and this webinar is being hosted by uh, CTBI and the Baptist Union of Great Britain. Now with us this evening we have some of the keenest minds in the country. This means that we'll have no doubt a dynamic 90 minutes of sterling conversation. And we're going to explore this evening the government's commission on race and ethnic disparities, otherwise known as the Sewell Report, which was released on the 31st of March uh, uh, 2021 during Holy Week of all weeks. Uh, and this 258 page report was chaired by Dr. Tony Sewell and it featured commissioners such as uh, Dr. Maggie Adarian Pocock, MBE, and Dr. Dambisa Moyo, among others. Now, to describe the report as controversial would be something of an understatement. But what is it actually saying to the church, to people of faith? With us this evening to discuss this are Professor Rob Beckford, who is one of the leading theologians in this country. And aside from his various academic endeavors, he's a writer, a filmmaker, and an international speaker at Al. We also have Alicia Luthi, who is, uh, well, she just completed her PhD at Canterbury Christ Church University. And she has also developed the Black Consciousness and Christian Faith Program that teaches at an introductory level, theology and religion in the community. We also have with us Sir Simon Woolley, who's a renowned equalities champion and is also the founder and the director of Operation Black Vote. Since 2019, he's been a crossbench uh, member of the House of Lords. And last month, he was appointed as principal of Homerton College in Cambridge. We also have with us Claire Williams, who is the founder of Get Real, a Christian apologetics organization which addresses questions about Christianity, particularly from uh, a perspective focusing on the black community. She has a degree in English literature and language from Oxford University and has completed her postgraduate training in theology at Whitcliffe Hall. We also have with us uh, Reverend Dr. Rosemary Malik, who is also a respected uh, university academic, but she's also the Archdeacon of Croydon. And we also have with us Wally Hudson Roberts, who, let me give him his proper title, the Reverend Wally Hudson Roberts, who is a Baptist pastor, and he leads the Baptist Union of Great Britain's work on racial justice. Uh, technical issues have meant that we are still awaiting the uh, arrival of Dr. David Muir. Hopefully he will be joining us uh, pretty soon. And uh, David is an academic and a theologian, and he's currently the head of Whitelands, which is a noted Church of England college that is part of the University of Roehampton. So we should have with us this evening seven uh, speakers. I'm calling them the Magnificent Seven. Uh, and I think that's a, an all-star lineup, uh, if I say so myself. Now, the format this evening is pretty straightforward. Uh, Robert will uh, start us off and he will provide a theological reflection on the report, ostensibly exploring what the Bible has to say on issues raised in the report. And he's going to be followed by Alicia, who will respond to Robert's reflection, but she will sort of focus particularly on uh, what the church needs to consider. And then this will be followed by Simon, who will provide a socio-political analysis of the report. Now, while the speakers are talking, I would encourage you to send in your questions. Uh, and we will endeavor to put your questions to the panel uh, right after the uh, presentations. Now, we've had a record number of registrations for this um, uh, uh, webinar. So uh, I can't promise that we will uh, you know, get to uh, ask your particular question. We'll do our best. We're gonna make sure that there's sufficient time to uh, ask as many questions as possible. And uh, some folk, when they registered 
sent in questions and we'll take those questions first. Now, this session is uh, being recorded and it's also going out live. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Robert Beckford, to start us off. So Robert, over to you, sir. Yeah, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. What I want to do in this five minute presentation slot that I've been, getting, begin, been given at the beginning is just run through some general themes that I think people of the Christian faith, particularly the black Christian faith, should consider when interrogating the report. I don't want to get into a granular analysis of the report. Hopefully that's something that uh, the other panelists will do by exploring individual sections of the report. But instead, I just want to provide a general framework for thinking, thinking critically from a Black Christian perspective about the report. Um, so look, Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, a Black theological report. The first thing that we need to acknowledge that is that so far, look, this report has received a lot of criticism um, from left, right, uh, center, all over. And we know that at this moment in time, a lot of organizations have distanced themselves from it. So we know it's controversial. It's stirred up a, a, a hornet's nest in many respects. And what I want to do is get behind why I think it has um, done this and, and how it, that will help us think it through uh, from a theological perspective. The first thing that we need to um, note, though, is that, look, when we're dealing with a report on race and racism in Britain. We come at this from a Christian perspective, which says to us that we have an anti, uh, kind of radically anti-racist position on this Christian gospel. The New Testament makes clear that while people might come from different ethnic backgrounds, uh, the whole idea of the Christian community is that they're meant to be different. They're meant to exhibit a radical inclusivity, treating people exactly the same. The New Testament tells us time and time again about how we're meant to do that. However, we know that within our history, it hasn't necessarily worked out that way. The whole idea of racial inclusion, racial justice is contested in Christian history. Post 1492 world has been one of racial terror for most people of African heritage, even inside the confines of the church. But that's the last word on it. We know that uh, Christian pneumatology tells us that if the church isn't going to do the work, God's going to find people who are going to do it. And some theologians would argue that movements like the civil rights movement was about the church. More recently, Black Lives Matter is an example of the spirit of God moving on issues of justice and inclusion, even if the church is left a little bit behind. Ben Lindsay's book, uh, um, we need to talk about, why well, the church needs to talk about race as an example of Christian intervention in this field in more recent years. But we need to acknowledge first off that the church is kind of behind on this issue. And therefore, when we look at this report, we need to remember what Jesus says about removing the uh, plank from your own eye first before you uh, deal with the speck in other people's um, eye. The other thing I think is important when looking at this report is how we analyze it from a biblical perspective. And what I mean by that specifically is, is looking at how in the black church tradition we've used the biblical text to engage in the resistance and opposition to oppressive forces, particularly racialized the forces, but also re-exist. How do we then re-exist, develop a new way of thinking and being in light of the opposition that we face? useful way of summarizing this. I guess it's simplistic and it's binary, but it's still quite useful. It's an approach taken by the Harvard intellectual Cornel West. Cornel West argues that black people have always responded in one of two ways to the crises that they face as a consequence of racialized oppression. One is the conservative behavioralist tradition and the other is a liberal structural tradition. I want to just talk about these two traditions and reflect on what it means for the race report. The conservative behavioral tradition is really about black conservatism inside the church. It's about taking personal responsibility in light of the problems that we face. It's about individual endeavor. So how do we get out of the predicament that we face? We sort it out ourselves. It's your personal responsibility. You look after yourself, you take care of yourself and, and your family, your community, but ultimately it's about our work. We're not looking to anybody else or the state. Well, it's about our own personal endeavor. Why? Because underneath this perspective, it presupposes that there's black creative genius. It's a kind of loose essentialist tradition that argues that there's this creative genius within black communities, within black people. And if we're given a level playing field, then the sky's the limit. So consequently, uh, there is no need for victimhood within this perspective. Why? Because we can actually do it. 
a, a, a strong essentialism because the black people are actually super people. Uh, they're not going that far. It's more sociological. This sense that with all that we've been through as a people, it gives us a certain perspective. What Du Bois called double consciousness, a unique gaze on the world. And as a consequence of that, given the opportunity to thrive and strive, we will do it. We shouldn't get uppity as black church people are offended by this because it's part of the black church tradition. Black conservatism, both in the Caribbean and in North America, emerges from the black church tradition itself. In the post-slave world, it's the black church who says, we will build schools. We will educate our people. We will develop business. We will endeavor to show that we are equal to anybody else. If this conservatism finds its way into the Garvey movement, for example. So it's part of the black Christian imagination. Fundamentally, this position, this first position believes that class is the issue, not race. And that's what you find within the Seawall Report. We believe, they say, it's important to look beyond race to other causes of disadvantage, even when considering issues of race and ethnicity. The life chances of the child of a Harrow-raised British Indian accountant and the child of a Bradford-raised British Pakistani taxi driver are as wide apart as they are partly because of the UK's economic geography. What are they trying to get out here? They're trying to get at the fact that it isn't just about race. There are socioeconomic factors and these socioeconomic factors dominate. This is part of the black conservative tradition. As I've kind of suggested, you know, this is um, part of the inside of the church tradition as well. It's not as far away from us as we actually think. What about the other tradition? The other tradition is the liberal structure tradition. They argue that in the post-made world, we suffer a systemic failure. The world is rigged against black and brown bodies. That was part of the colonial order and it's been retained within the post-colonial world and that's why we need to dismantle it. They believe therefore that you have to have structural change. The issue isn't about individual endeavor, it's about structural change. The systems itself needs to change education, change what's taught, change who teaches it, change the what ways in which we, we um, the pedagogic practices, all of that needs to change. Why? Because again, Underneath this is this sense that there is this black creative genius and that given 11 playing field, black people will thrive and strive and do as well as anybody else. But you've got to change the structures. It isn't so much about what's happening in the individual subject, individual psychology or even the background. It's what happens in that school space, in that workspace, in that healthcare space that really affects life chances. Fantastic example of this work is Kindy Andrews's new book, The New Age of Empire, which demonstrates systematically how in the post slave world, system structures, institutions are negatively trained on black life to ensure that we do not thrive and, and survive. So that's the liberal tradition. The high point of this tradition, civil rights movement, is within the black church. The black church, you see, while holding on to this conservative tradition, also has promoted this notion that we need to change the system. Principalities and powers. The world out there, it, there's, a, there's a cosmic struggle taking place. And evil will find a home where evil finds a home. And therefore, we need to resist it. See, this unique position within the black church tradition is balanced between the conservative position and the uh, liberal tradition. So therefore, black church tradition has always been open to the idea of intersectionality, race, class, and gender. The brilliant work of Quimbley Crenshaw demonstrating that race is always intersected with class, issues of, uh, of um, gender, sexuality, and therefore when you're considering any kind of uh, question around access to resources, about power, about education, all of these things have to be analyzed in section. Of course, some people are gonna be more advantaged than others, but you cannot just solely focus on race. Remember the danger of the single story, it's much more complex here. And therefore, it's a critique of the first position that just wants to do, that wants to evade questions of race. It's, again, it's black church, just some amazing capacity to hold these two in tension. Why does it do it? Because of what the text says. Because of what scripture says. Scripture says, on the one hand, there's individual responsibility. Galatians 6, 5. Get out your Bible now for those of you in Bible class now, you know. Scripture time. Each will have to bear his own load. Should be his or uh, hers there. Should not the inclusive version. It's about individual responsibility, but there's also at the heart of the biblical tradition, this awareness of structural evil. Foundation, of the Old Testament world is the Exodus narrative. And the whole idea behind that being that there's structural evil systems set up to oppress other people. Biblical text gives you both of them. Not so with the Sewell Report. Sewell Report, you see, 
two quotes from it that push it in one direction. Put simply, we no longer see a Britain where the system is deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities. The impediments and disparities do exist. They are varied. And ironically, very few of them are directly to do with racism. See, again, pushing it. The report towards the behaviorist perspective and neglecting the structural issues, although I'm sure some people will show that the structural issues are there in the background and often they're kind of confused in terms of what the report is talking about what's attempted to do. Another quote then is, too often racism is the catch-all explanation and can simply be explicitly accepted rather than explicitly examined. Again, pushing the report's analytical focus within the conservative behaviorist camp and not taking seriously these are the liberal structural considerations. They're there mildly within the port, but they're in the background. See, that balance that's there within the black church tradition, that's there within scripture, isn't taken seriously within the report. So in conclusion, what does a black Christian perspective demand of us then? Well, it's a both and proposition. You've got to weigh up these two sides of the argument seriously and with equal rigor and with balance. Why? Because the biblical text promotes a holistic approach to solving these problems. It's not just individual, it's social. It's not just left, it's right. It can't just be left to the supernatural, it's also material. And so consequently, when we, we weigh up black Christian tradition, biblical tradition against the report, the report is imbalanced. And that I think is part of its, its problem for people of faith, apart from some of the more detailed issues around race. For me, fundamentally, that's where it's lacking. The analytical focus is skewed. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Robert. Um, and I'm sure we're going to hear much more from you uh, during the Q&A. Speaking of questions, I would encourage you to send in your questions. They're uh, coming in. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully we will have plenty of time uh, to take your questions. Uh, over to Alicia. So Alicia, if you could re respond to, uh, to Robert's uh, presentation just now. Thank you um, for having me and thank you so much, Robert, for that introduction. So there are three recommendations that I am gonna to make today. Um, and these recommendations are for our churches. Often leaders and people in the congregation say, what can we do on Sunday? What can we do this year? How can we make practical steps that are accessible and realistic um, in consideration of all the other things that churches are doing. And so the first point and recommendation I'm gonna make is that churches should consider taking seriously generating evidence-based research about their local congregations that can provide better insights into the lived experiences of British ethnic minority communities and the intersections of beliefs, politics, and their ability to thrive in the UK. Simple surveys will tell you a lot more about your church, help to develop that cultural and ethnic sensitivity, and more rigorous research can contribute to national reports, um, international reports as well, taking more seriously the role of Christianity, our religious attitudes, um, and our social relationships within uh, British churches and community settings as well. The second recommendation is developing and engaging with our theological conversations about racial discrimination. Particularly, we need to reflect and reevaluate uh, many Christian stances, a colorblind theological stance, and an anti politics stance as well. If you feel um, convicted um, or convinced about your colorblind theology and anti political stance, Despite those feelings, people in your congregation do not feel the same. Young people do not feel the same. And people in the community do not feel the same. And they have questions. And we should be a place where people can come with those questions and um, offer support, offer a place to reflect as well. And so congregations should develop a well-considered biblical case for their response to racial ethnic discrimination and its presence in church and in the wider society. And it is this biblical response that is the prophetic voice for the wider society. And so response teams are a really, really good way of making this manageable, getting one leadership member, a few congregation members, getting them trained a racial justice course, for example, and getting them readily available to be able to help people in the church, in the community, process, uh, reevaluate and reflect on these issues and then develop responses as well. Key events like Black Lives Matter protests, 
the killing of George Floyd, all of these, there needs to be a space and a response team in our local churches that says, come, let's talk about this, let's work this through, and let's have a theological conversation about um, the political implications that it has on our community, and, um, and also how we then can respond um, appropriately, actively and intentionally um, as a church body and community. And the third and final recommendation is that churches should position themselves to be responsive um, to some of these recommendations, working collaboratively and ecumenically with other churches, being an example of communities that work through differences in love and seeking justice, designing processes for challenging racial and ethnic discrimination in our churches and ch Christian institutions. I'm talking reprimand. I'm talking um, what when someone has um, an issue, raises an issue, who deals with it? What are the processes and what happens? Who is held accountable? And what does that accountability look like? It's we're well, beyond just pray about it. Yes, we must forgive, but also we must petition, we must protest, and we must reprimand wickedness, evilness, and see people's lives change and see them repent as well. Developing and engaging with training programs. There are training programs out there that enable leaders, outreach workers, and others to be sensitive to cultural and ethnic difference, and developing ways of being genuinely inclusive. And then finally, developing an inclusive curriculum for church teaching and preaching that broadens and deepens our theological imagination beyond Western traditions, both conservative and progressive, and engaging with the various Christian theological resources from within the British, Black, and Brown communities. And so there's the overarching three points. Number one, evidence-based research. Let's start developing our own research, getting to know our churches once again, getting to know our communities once again, and looking at those intersections of religious attitudes, political beliefs, and ability to thrive in the UK. Second, theological conversations, developing well-considered biblical cases for our responses in our local churches, in our denominations, um, and then de and also developing response teams and um, to help manage the tasks of responding to these issues, both biblically teaching, um, but also community engagement and, in, and, and perhaps government advocacy. And finally, engaging with the recommendations, working collaboratively, designing processes for challenging racial discrimination in terms of reprimands and accountability engaging with training programs, racial justice training programs, and finally, an inclusive curriculum. Our resources need to be representative of the multitude of voices in Britain, whose culture, whose predispositions, whose experiences um, affect um, the way and impact the way that they understand God and the Bible as well. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much for that, Alicia. Uh uh, next up is Simon. Simon, could you just uh, just say a few words to make yes. sure that you're awesome? Thank you very much, and thank you all. Um, I'm so impressed that on a Wednesday night at eight o'clock, when we want to be with our kids, our families, our loved ones, um, that we can come together for this conversation. This this conversation is is so important. This is not just for us, not just for our families. The conversation that we're embarking on this evening is a conversation for a generation. But I want us to start from, it's very important to start from why we begun this conversation. Why this commission to look at racial disparities was called for in the first place. We have to go back over a year when the pandemic started. And in those first weeks and months, what was happening in front of our very eyes, on our screens, on a daily basis, is something I don't want to see again. Because every evening, there was a kaleidoscope of black and brown faces that were dying shockingly disproportionate by this disease. First, it was the doctors. 97 of the first 100 doctors that died were non-white. Many African, 
Caribbean, and Asian. And then it began to cascade wider. Nurses, porters, cleaners, care workers, bus drivers. And there were still in greater numbers, black and brown. And we instinctively said, something's wrong. Why us? Who was going to help explain? And very quickly, people came out of the woodwork. I don't know where they came from. But they very quickly said, this is, uh, don't worry about this. This is, this is uh, nothing to do with uh, because you're black. It's actually, what it is, it is because you're black. It's, it's your immune system. It's your DNA. You're dying because you are inferior. I mean, talk about add insult to injury in the nation's heartache was beyond belief for people like me. But it didn't take us long to find out what was really happening because all you had to do with COVID-19 was join the dots. And the people that were dying, doctors, nurses, porters, cleaners, were all people that were overly exposed to the disease. People said, well, doctors, they're not, they're not poor, so don't give us all of that nonsense. But they were overly exposed without the PPP, protective uh, clothing that was needed. So they were dying. But the others, care workers, bus drivers, security guards, many of those were dying because they couldn't protect themselves because of their work status. Two key factors, low pay and zero hour contracts. So a quarter of those that died in the care workers were on zero hour contracts. What does that mean? What it means is that if you don't work, you don't get paid. And if you don't get paid, you can't pay the rent. You can't look after your children. I remember the, the tragic story of Emmanuel Gomez, a cleaner at the Ministry of Justice. He felt ill, very ill, but he was on a zero hour contract. And he said, if I don't work, I don't get paid. And he died, like many others. And we said, Follow the disease and you will see the structural inequalities that particularly affect African, Asian, Caribbean communities. And it was that that was the starting point that was demanding the government address this disproportionality. That was then convulsed by the death of George Floyd when we talked to the streets. And young people said, actually, you know, the death of George Floyd is not a million miles from here, too. It wasn't just the need that killed George Floyd. It was the system. And it's the system that has been killing black and brown people in police custody here, too. That's the, that's the worst end. But the other end is, of course, we all knew this during stop during the lockdown, when 95 percent of the nation is protected, stop and search for black people went up by 25 percent. 25% from the previous year. We knew there was a crucial problem and we demanded. So Boris Johnson said, we need a commission. But the people behind the commission, Manira Mirza and Tony Saul, who were brought in, were people who for the last decade and more have started with this one central premise. Systemic racism does not exist. So they brought these people together who would then spend nine months proving that systemic racism doesn't exist. In spite of the heartache, their starting point was their conclusion they had even before anything was written. I think, Robert, people were so upset because 
what it said was, is that campaigners like me and you and Whale and Rosemary and others have been fighting with our brothers and sisters for 50, 60 years to tell the state there are systemic problems and you acknowledge them and you can deal with them. But if you don't acknowledge them, you have nothing to deal with. You say it's our own fault. We deserve to be poor. We deserve to be unemployed. Today, when you woke up this morning, you heard the news and the news said that the ONS and the Resolution Foundation are found in this particular downturn due to COVID-19, black people are nearly 40% unemployed, 40. The national average is 13%. But without a systemic acknowledgement, there's no systemic problem. Mm. I'll finish on this, because I know you've got a lot to talk about and I need to cook my son some food too, he's been waiting patiently. But when Whale said to me, I said, Whale, I'm there, I'm there. Why? Because what we should be having is the biggest, strongest, deepest discussion that our society has ever had, ever, about our structures. The disease has laid that bare for us. Follow the disease in health, in housing, in jobs, in education. And you have the opportunity, not just to build back better, but to build new, better. The 1945 moment, if you like, honest conversation it was bad before covid we had the opportunity to make it much better what have we done shut the door hard on our watch my brothers and sisters you must not let half a dozen commissioners present this as robert may have suggested that this is six of one and half a dozen of the other. It isn't. It really isn't. It's 999 of one, our lived experiences, in all areas, at all levels, and one of the other. The only difference is this, and I'll close on this, is what will the black church leadership do? How will we respond? How we respond to the crisis, how we respond to this rubbish of our lived experiences. And I know, Alicia, that you wanted to talk about, you wanted to talk about the recommendations. I don't, and I don't for this reason. 20 years ago, we just celebrated the McPherson report. Robert, ask yourself but one question. What is the one memory that comes out of that report that you can say? a posh white man for the first time in British history acknowledged there was systemic racism. What is the one thing that people remember from this deceitful report? Systemic racism is a myth. We are poor because it's our fault. Our children get marked down because it's their fault. On our watch, on our watch, we must not let that happen. This is not a party political stance. This is a plea, this is a plea to our community, for our generation. This is on our watch. It's not personal for Tony and the others. They're entitled to their opinion. We must strongly reject it because our future demands it. Thank you, Well, thank you. Uh, Robert, I'm sorry that I can't stay on for the whole evening. It's been a long, long day. It's been a long few weeks uh, with pushing back on this report, but I wanted to be with you. I wanted to be in church solidarity. Thank you uh, very much uh, for that, Simon. Uh, before you uh, disappear, we've got a, you know, maybe you could stay to answer a couple of questions. Uh, before we move on to the questions, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my good friend, David Muir. Thank you, David. Thank you for your persistence. He's been trying to get onto this call for about at least an hour. Um, uh, and, and he's done it, praise God, as, as I would say. And we look forward to your contribution this evening. So as, um, 
as has been uh, uh, mentioned, we've uh, we've received a number of questions, and I'm looking at the Q and A box now, and we've got forty questions in there. Um, so what we're going to do for the rest of our uh, evening together is to go through some of those questions. And as I mentioned before, when some people registered, they sent in questions. Um, and the first question is this. Um, it says this. It's, uh, it says, is it the case that ordinary Christians throughout the country are by no means all signed up to the current Britain is deeply institutionally race, a racist country? orthodoxy and many of us welcome the report which seeks to approach the subject of institutional racism thoughtfully and analytically rather than dogmatically so uh that's someone who's sort of saying uh you know it's not uh all to be trashed as such i'm gonna actually put this question to someone who hasn't spoken this evening i'm gonna put back to uh to reverend wally hudson roberts so wally uh do you care to answer that one I think among the many reasons why slavery created vast sums of money and wealth and provided the engine to the um, industrial revolution in Britain was in part because the churches were not challenged in um, the institution of slavery. They refused to be dogmatic in defending the human rights of the enslaved. They were complicit and watched injustice from the margins. However, when some in the church started to speak prophetically against the institution of slavery and its impact upon the enslaved, um, like Sam Sharp, for example, the force of the subsequent protest, the prophetic, radical and dogmatic nature of that voice contributed to its abolition some, some years later. What, what we observe, we, we observe a similar dogmatic posture in, in God, I, I believe, embodied in Jesus, when in the temple, outraged at the institutional abuse he witnessed, he used physical and verbal force to shed light on on reprehensible behavior. Jesus was not being timid on this occasion. He was, at, he was actually being um, very dogmatic against the principalities of darkness. Institutional racism is, is institutional abuse. It is not a form of institutional abuse. It is institution, institutional abuse forced on black and brown people. And our responses should be proportionate um, to that. And we see that exemplified in the likes of King, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, I, um, IDB Wells. A passive or denial approach is an abdication of responsibility, which is contrary to the God who stands on the side of the Canaanites uh, the, the, um, and the poor. I, I think to do anything less is a complete abdication of, of of responsibility. It is important, particularly in this context, that we assume an assertive, authoritative, strategic, um, and if you want, dogmatic posture. History teaches us that it is important, and the Bible also teaches us that it's important. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Simon, can you give us 50 minutes of your time, 50 more minutes of your time, is that okay? Good, excellent. So what I'll do is um, I'm going to go to uh, folk who haven't said anything yet. Uh, so there's a question here which says the report questions the usage of the term Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic or BAME. What are your views on this uh, nomenclature or acronym and what is the alternative term uh, to capture the increasing diversity in Britain. I'm going to put that question to uh, to Rosemary, to Rosemary Mallet. So Rosemary, over to you on that one. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Well, I think anyone who's been following um, a, a debate about issues of ethnicity um, and in and within this country will know that uh, the, the, the acronym uh, BAME suddenly then turned into a word, BAME, which started then to be used as a label for people as a ragtag label that collect that that's homogenized people from a wide variety of heritages, countries, continents, and colors. Um, and so the, the phrase, it meant that so many people actually started to refuse to have that um, label attached to them. 
I think when we come up with different ways of trying to put groups together, and we always do that statistically and sociologically, and at the beginning, they may find themselves as a, a useful way of trying to group people together to then make um, discussions and arguments about challenging situations. When we start to turn it into a label um, where it then starts to describe in a negative way a group of people, it has served its purpose. And certainly over the past three or four years, that, um, that nomenclature, that label has long served its purpose. So what are the uh, alternatives that people are starting um, to use? Well, I think people would like them uh, to be able to be described as who they are, or what their heritage is in the same way as we may describe the Scottish, the Irish, the Welsh, the French, the, the Spanish, um, without necessarily all talking about them as being a WEM, a white European majority group in. We would not do that. So, the, so one thing is to actually um, give people um, the, the respect of their ethnic heritage or their, their background. If that isn't the can't be the case because we want to talk more globally, then some phrases that are being used at the moment, and these are developing and evolving. Um, so uh, quite often within the Church of England now, we're using the uh, UKME. It's not perfect, but what it tries to say is that within the United Kingdom, there are people who are from a minority ethnic background, but only because they're within the United Kingdom. If they come from, if they were not within the United Kingdom, they would not be a part of a minority background. And I allude uh, to the uh, context of the numbers of people from Hong Kong, Hong Kongers who will be coming over to this country in the next year or so. They would never have been popped into the BAME category at all. Um, they're coming from a, a continent and a place where they come from a majority culture and they're part of a majority uh, Chinese group in many of them. But when they get to this country, they would find themselves as a minority ethnic group. So we in the Church of England are, are using UKME, but we're also using people of a global majority or global majority heritage, because that gives us the capacity to enable those readers to understand that we recognize um, the, the ways in which calling people a minority has to a certain extent contributed to the ways in which we have a systematized, um, a, a racist perspective of people from different um, cultures, black and brown and Asian cultures. So it's evolving. Um, it's based on ethnicity, on color and culture. And so we're not quite there yet, but ones that are being used at the moment are UKME, are um, Global Majority Heritage, and America, they are, are using people of color. Um, so these phrases are evolving, but I can definitely say that BAME and certainly BAME is no longer acceptable and no one wants that label attached to them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Rosemary. The next question we uh, have uh, says this. It says, um, is race now part of the ongoing culture wars that pit those who are deemed of the left, progressive, or woke against the right, socio-cultural conservatives, or traditionalists on both sides of the Atlantic? And if this is the situation, in which camp should Christians, particularly black ones, find themselves? I'm going to put this to David, uh, David Muir. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And of course, thank uh, the panelists for an excellent uh, discourse. And of course, thank Simon. I mean, Simon has been at this for, for decades. He speaks with an authority and, and in integrity uh, second to none. Let me, let me try and reframe the question by saying three things. First and foremost, when we talk about cultural wars in the UK, it's, it is almost, it's almost problematic. Um, back in um, February, Times Radio actually did a poll asking the British public about their understanding of cultural wars. Believe it or not, 76% of people didn't have a clue what this was about, 15% were probably on the right track. And only about 7% knew precisely what this was about. 
So this is um, um, a US uh, phenomenon that is almost becoming popular with certain parts of the establishment. And I say certain parts of the establishment because we're talking about a narrative and a trope that says, for example, or that is um, characterized by at least four things. The first one, there is a real downplaying of the, of the persistence of racism in our dominant institutions. Secondly, there is an elevation, and I think Simon had mentioned this earlier on, of the work ethic or the, patholo the pathologization of the black family. In other words, if you don't um, succeed, it isn't the fault of the institution, it's actually your fault. And although we're not talking about the report and it's our recommendation, I do want people to understand that Tony Sewell's ideas or the um, provenance of Tony's ideas go back a very, very long way. Tony Sewell was telling black parents at least 15, 20 years ago, that if your kids are failing at school, it's not because of racism, it's because they're not paying um, attention. In 2010, Tony Sewell wrote an article in the, in the um, Spectator magazine, where he basically was saying that institutional racism does not exist. My point is this, if you are looking for an independent report about race um, disparity, you don't go and put someone there to chair it who um, denies there is such a thing as institutional racism. So I think that's just a digression. But the other thing is that this characteristic of the kind of culture war, it's the people who kind of say, when you think about immigrants, migrants, or um, refugee, well, if they die in the ocean, that's their fault. They shouldn't be trying to come here um, uh, in any case. And by the way, why are we giving 0.7 of our GDP to poor countries when we've got poor people in Bradford and Leeds and elsewhere? That is the narrative of the culture war. And then of course, you have a culture um, um, secretary that says that if you get politically exercised by statues that you think are totally racist, if you're gonna to try to have any campaign against that, the cultural secretary is going to stop your grants. That tells you something about what is actually going on. And the last kind of characteristic is this kind of name calling. And let's call it what it is. It's actually name calling. If you are conscious about racial um, um, disparity, if you think there's something systematically wrong with certain of our institution, if you dare to talk about racial justice or identity and politics, you're somehow woke. So woke becomes a form of name calling. Like I said, this is American. And for Christian leaders on this call, I want you to think about something which I think is crucial. Last year, there was an interesting book by, um, by Christine uh, Dumez, a fantastic title. It's called Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. And what's interesting, is that the book is arguing that white evangelicals, okay, didn't support Trump for pragmatic reasons, but Trump was rather the fulfillment of white evangelicals' deeply held values. And what do we mean by that? Well, think about the kind of slogan, make America great again was making it white, wasn't it? Make America great again was getting away with any unpreferential treatment for black folks who had suffered racism for, um, century. What can we learn in this country? Well, I think we can learn a great deal. And I want to say that, you know, um, Simon was right. You know, I was around during the Scarman report. I was a young um, student. I was around during the 85 riots in Brixton. I got caught up in that. You know, I took part in the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. So when Doreen Lawrence tells us that this discourse, this narrative coming out of the Sewell report, is going to set us back at least 20 years. She's absolutely right. Why is she right? Because institutions are trying to deny the lived experience of black people. You all know many years ago, um, uh, Paul Gilroy wrote that amazing book in the eighties, there ain't no black in the Union Jack. Please see that as a metaphor for black exclusion from the dominant our institutions of our nation. Yes, I know that we're not where we were. Of course we're not. 
but we've got a long way to actually go. And let me finish by saying one final thing. Uh, CLR James, our great Caribbean historian, he once said that dialectics is about anticipating the future. I've got five grandchildren and five daughters. You know, what would the future look like for my grandkids? Well, I think as a Christian, I want the future to almost be that kind of an Augustinian future that says hope, and we must be hopeful. Otherwise, what's the point? Augustine says that hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. We have still got to continue this battle. Simon knows it, Wally knows it, Robert knows it. Why? Because racism, like um, capitalism, has a way to reconstitute itself. It gives you the illusion that things are changing. That's the narrative of this new cultural war. And anyone who dares to say, because of their experience or because of historical um, reality, that we are still suffering with institutional racism, get name call. Well, listen, I'm happy to be woke because back in the uh, 70s and 80s, if you were young, black conscious and Christian, you also call a lot of names. Today, I'm happy to say I'm still black, I'm still Christian, and I'm still concerned about institutional racism. We still have a long way to actually go. Thank you uh, very much for that, uh, David. Um, got a next question here, and um, uh, which is, uh, Churches, particularly the Pentecostal one, they're often described as success stories in the UK. Is there something in this report which taps into that achievement? And should this not be celebrated? I'm going to put that to Claire. Claire's been quiet. So Claire, please, over to you on this one. Thank but you. after Claire, we'll get one a quick question in from Simon because he has to go. And um, hopefully Alicia's mic is better. So she might be able to contribute. And uh, But uh, over to you first, Claire. Thank you. I think there's a problematic phrase in the report which talks about, it says about three times a fatalistic account or a fatalistic narrative, this idea that the, the whole of society is stacked against the experience of um, ethnic minorities. Now, if we take that phrase and accept it, that there is this fatalistic narrative that um, ethnic minorities have, then I think there is a cause to celebrate that the black church does actually resist this. And actually um, there's lots of success that the black Pentecostal church in particular um, develops in its attendees, for instance, the social action, there's lots of food banks, food partial initiative, engagement with young people, engagement with senior citizens, uh, community engagement in general, the black church is very um, active in terms of social action and it's theology as well, the idea that God is on the side of the marginalized the idea that god has a plan and a purpose for our lives the black church can, should be celebrated and i think also growing up myself as a preacher's kid in the black church black pentecostal church um seeing people uh, in leadership positions speaking um you know it just affirmed my dignity as a black person in the in the pentecostal church but i think that there is also um along with the celebrations that we can make of what the black church does as a success is to investigate and start to interrogate a little bit the kind of pietism sometimes that the Black Pentecostal Church has, which is uh, um, being fixated on personal holiness, which is no bad thing, which is a good thing, but also we need to become more outward looking to show that the gospel is about the saving of one's souls as well as the outworking of that being um, transformation in, in, in society and politically more political engagement, not just socially kind of like the local church level. And I think that's what Elisa and Robert Beckford were trying to get at about the both and this holistic picture, which I think um, the millennials and I guess Gen Z um, sort of um, demographic of the Black Pentecostal Church is starting to tap into. But I think we need to be moving that more and not being afraid to address maybe little p politics, even from the pulpit. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Simon, I know you've got to go, uh, but before you go, let me just put this question to you. And it's uh, one of the questions that was sent in. Mm. It says, uh, do you agree like uh, Baroness Doreen Lawrence that this report gives racists the green light and has pushed the fight against racism back 20 years or more? So if you could briefly respond. Well, to I'm that. afraid I'm afraid it does potentially push us back because, look, there are many challenges that we want in our society. 
in health, in education, in housing, in the criminal justice system. You know, 40% of the young men uh, in youth incarceration are black, Asian, minority ethnic, many of them black, uh, African and, and Caribbean. And so we need to stop that. We need to stop the systemic uh, conveyor belt that is crucifying many of our young um, black men. Um, without systemic change, that you, it's always down to the individual and the state relinquishes all responsibility. And, and I just think that, imagine this for a second, Chair, that the government um, sponsor report into, into anti-Semitism, right? And then without prompt, the chair of that report says, oh, let me just tell you about the Holocaust while I'm speaking to you. There were good things about it too. As the report talks about the enslavement of our descendants, there were good things. I'm not quite sure what they talk about about the good things about slavery. Was it, is it the fact that Simon Woolley is not an African name? That my culture has been erased? That my history and culture is no longer on my lips? I don't know what they're talking about. It is so disingenuous, so insulting. Now, Claire, of course, there are good stories to be told, but that is in spite of the obstacles. And it's in spite of the obstacles because every parent on this call will have told their children, you have to do well at school. You have to be bigger, you have to be better. I, I can't take a chance. The one thing this report does say is that there has been uh, something that isn't in poor white working class communities and that is e education aspiration. We have that because we see it as a route out. But even when we have that aspiration, we still hit the wall in all areas at all at all uh, levels. Uh, this, we have to have our own narrative, our own story, and we have to tell our government, look, sometimes you get things wrong. And the best way to do it is to put your hands up uh, and, to, and to find a new way. But what we find with this report, I think David Muir touched upon it, this report isn't for us. It really isn't. This report is for white working class that say, whilst we've been dealing with Black Lives Matters, we're not dealing with you. What this report is, it's not for our consumption. It's for that red wall up in the North where they want to win votes. I'm fine with the government wanting to win them votes, but not at our expense, but not our future mustn't be thrown under the bus to win white working class votes. The Christian way would say, it's not an either or, we can do both. But, but Claire, we have to recognize both. And when you recognize both, you can deal with it, honestly, with love, with affection, with creativity. This does the opposite to that. And uh, it, it, shames, it shames us all. The last thing I would say is this, what I really despise about this report is, is that the way that it pits white working class against black working class, it pits Africans against Caribbeans. Africans are good, Caribbeans are lazy. Muslims are bad, Hindus are good. Come on, we're better than that. We're much better than that. And I hope that we will find our way to reach out to white working class, to reach out to other faith groups, to say together, together we're better than that and we can forge a pathway for us all to excel. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, churches together, for showing leadership in this critical time. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, Simon. Alicia, could you say a few words? Let me just check what your mic is one, like. One, two, one, two. How am I sounding? Yeah, that's a lot better. What do you think? What do the rest of you think? Thumbs up? Okay, excellent. Listen, uh, what Alicia said is that she's going to re-record uh, her, um, her, her talk, and we're going to actually then sort of splice that bit back into our recording uh, this evening. Um, got a question here which says this, says leaving aside whether Britain is institutionally racist, is it time for us to redefine what we mean by institutional racism? 
is the 1999 McPherson report definition still fit for purpose and seeing as your mic's a lot better now, Alicia, do you want to take that question? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's always really important to be in conversation with the definitions that we have. It's always good to be in conversation, re-evaluating whether it's fit for purpose. What we have to be careful of is when we go into a process of what this, this person is calling redefinement is that we're not moving the goalposts because what definitions do, something like institutional racism, is obviously it helps us to define strategies and um, identify the issues as well. There are different types of racism. We've got, obviously in the report, it talks about the difference between institutional and structural and systemic. Uh, we can debate that for years. We've had um, more recent developments um, and ideas talking about um, social racism in terms of microaggressions, those types of things that we experience relationally between people in our houses, between people at work, between people at church. Um, the McPherson um, definition particularly why I say in many respects it is fit for purpose, and I think of this in respect to bringing this conversation to the church, is because there is a looseness about it that helps us to apply it to our institution as the church as well. Um, I, and although people may not consider church life a professional service, we are a body of servants um, to one another and to the world. Um, and I think that um, although people would love to see, I guess, and, and from what I've read, um, the, the definition tightened or a bit more explicit. In some ways, it's, it's sometimes when I read it, I just feel like <clears throat> people, it's, it, it defines people who are racist by accident. And probably for me, that's one way I would improve it if I was to consider redefining it. But redefining institutional racism, I think, isn't if we go too far, we move the goalposts and we need to be very sure what we mean by institutional racism so we, so we can continue to define our strategies. As Dr. David Muir was saying earlier, what racism and institutional racism may look like may change, but there is an essence there that we can capture, that we can identify. And I think a good solid definition um, is really, really useful for keeping us on track um, because we want to take down institutional racism, we want to take down structural, systemic, social, all different facets of racism, we want to take them down by each avenue of racism, each type in each face um, requires different strategies. Um, and that's, that's what I would say on that. Excellent, thank you very much. The questions, as I've said, are coming in thick and fast. So I've got one here from Nathan Eddy and he says, how would the presenters respond to Jesse Jackson's phrase that the UK is the mother of racism? What is our international role in fighting racism? Question mark. Uh, any, any, uh, any takers for that one? I'm looking at uh, Robert and David Muir. Any yeah, takers? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I don't mind answering that one. I think um, two things to say about it. He's right and not so right. He's right in the sense that in the age of empire, we can look at the way in which Britain as an agent of violent settler colonialism, the Caribbean and North America, instituted racialized oppression as a means of control of indigenous people and later on enslaved people that were uh, captured and trafficked across the Atlantic and made to work in slave labor camps in the Caribbean and in North America. So it's right in that sense. And you can look at individual intellectual architects of British racism, both in philosophy and also in theology. We can, uh, for example, if you go to the Caribbean case in Jamaica specifically, there are sermons, there are letters home, there are documents written by church people which legitimate racism. You can look at, for example, Morgan Godwin's work on Christian racism, uh, 17th century, institutionalizing the whole idea that Christians can be enslaved in the church can endorse that. So he's right in that sense, not so right, because we're talking about the emergence of scientific racism, kind of pseudoscientific racism uh, that emerges in the 18th century. Then we have to go further into Europe. We can look at Francois Bernier. We can look at maybe the work of Blumenbach and the measuring of skulls. Uh, we can look um, uh, even, a bit, even a bit later uh, into the early 19th century and look at the way in which um, other forms of racism develop within the European context. So his rights, in terms of the same Britain as part, but there's a backstory for this in terms of European history as well. Excellent. David, do you want to add anything to that? 
just to say that uh, Robert is absolutely right historically. And, you know, um, at the university, we try and teach our students to be critical of the sources, the writers. I mean, take the great so-called Enlightenment period, you know, when there was rationality, there was science, and there was openness. You know, none other than um, David, um, um, David Hume wrote in 1748 on national um, characters makes it quite clear that all other species of people are inferior to white folks. That's enlightenment. And if he wasn't bad enough, Immanuel Kant celebrated in our, all our universities and all our institution of a great enlightenment man was commenting on a black uh, brother and Kant, who we know for his categorical um, imperatives and his reason. Kant's rationality, the height of his science, was to say this man was so black, it was clear proof that he was stupid. In other words, you know, these, these tropes are absolutely nothing new. And let me finish with this last thing. History is important, and we need to make sure we understand what's going on. Take something as simple as the Windrush scandal, okay? But don't forget, June 1948, as our forefathers were docking in Tilbury, 11 Labour MP, not Tories, 11 Labour MPs wrote to the Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, complaining that these black folks from the Caribbean were totally unsuitable by culture, by education, and by morals to come to Britain. Why? They said, and these are MPs, you know, that we would in, in, endanger the peace and tranquility of the nation. I wonder if we can have a campaign to get Keir Starmer to apologize to the Windrush generation for that ridiculous letter of June 1948. Now, as I say, and, and I believe this passionately, when I was a young boy, my father told me I had to be twice as good as a white person. Hey, I took that seriously. But I also know, I also know that things are not as bad as they are. We know that. And any report that tells us that, it, that if we don't acknowledge that, somehow we are blind, Estate agents can no longer tell you that you can't buy a house because you're actually black. And we know there are no longer signs that says no Irish, no blacks and no dogs. We know that. But institutions have got a lovely way to reconstitute um, themselves and to discriminate against people. Even though we know that African students are doing better than Caribbean, here is the joke. Whether you're African or you're Caribbean, you're still gonna be 40% unemployed. Right? If that's not about institutional racism, well, tell me what actually is. Um, Simon mentioned the kind of doctors, right? Whether you are a doctor, a medic, a PhD, for whatever reason, you're still going to get fire on the front line. So, what are we saying? We're saying that our churches have got to take race seriously. And all the work that you do and Wally do and all the other people, we have got to redouble our effort. And if we don't do it now, when are we going to do it? And we need to call our churches and challenge our churches. And dare I say, even leave our churches. If our churches are not doing it, leave them. Find other brothers and sisters that are committed to racial justice. Why? Black Lives Matter is not just a nice, elegant, a political slogan. Black Lives Matter is a biblical imperative. Just, just, just to add to what David is saying, and maybe bringing um, Lisa and Claire as well, in terms of what, uh, and Rosemary, in terms of what the church can do, I think that there are three things that are really important. Um, one, and Alicia will, and, and Claire will tell you, there are black people running projects that engage with learning and education to promote understanding. There are black churches and communities and courses that will facilitate, um, that, that enable black people to train to be agents of change, uh, community organizing. So I think what this report suggests, uh, ironically, is that there is capacity within the community to affect change. Uh, it's just that they don't acknowledge the other side of the, the equation as well, the structural uh, challenge. But there is capacity, and that's what we have to do, build that capacity and push for change. And I think Claire, Rosemary and Alicia probably have um, individual examples or, uh, of this kind of activity. I'm sure they do. But listen, we, the questions are coming in thick and fast. I've never seen this box so full since I've been doing these webinars. So look, let me give, put another question to both Rosemary and to Claire. And it's this from Mr. Michael Thomas. And he says, 
we have to ask whether a narrative that claims nothing has changed for the better, and I think uh, that was alluded to by David just now, and that the dominant feature of our society is institutional racism and white privilege will achieve anything beyond alienating the decent center ground, a center ground which is occupied by people of all races and ethnicities. Brackets to so report. Is the panel alarmed that the, that the discussion of race has become very polarized and can they suggest how this polarization can be overcome? So it's a pretty wordy question, but it's, uh, you know, it's questioning whether things have got better, if things have changed for the better, and how can we avoid uh, this sort of polarization? And how can we overcome it, really? I'm sure as Christians, how can we overcome it? Rosemary, you're chomping at the bit. Let me put that one to you first, and then, Claire, uh, you can come in afterwards. I think, um, just to say that David has already spoken to this, because no one is saying that things have not changed and that we haven't seen improvements across um, the spectrum in terms of the uh, representation of uh, black, Asian um, and people of color at a, a variety, at high levels at a variety of institutions. The challenge always is, is that you will find that there may be one or two people in an institution at a senior level. And then you're going to find that, that, that if there are other people um, from those um, ethnic groups in that institution, they're going to be more than likely at the most uh, junior levels and holding the most, um, uh, the, the, the positions which have the, the least status. Certainly within the, the Church of England, and I think people will know that um, last year, 2020, the Archbishop of Canterbury um, uh, recognized the institution as institutionally racist because of the ways in which, not only from the legacy of Windrush, and, and as David was talking about Windrush, I suddenly wondered if that letter that was written by the Labour MPs somehow impacted upon those ministers who told the people that turned up at their churches actually go and find another the church to go to because it's not um you're not going to maybe you might come and corrupt what we've got going here and if there was some linkage going on just as you said that and i think that moving along 70 80 years later we still find although yes we do have um, um ministers like myself who are senior leaders in the church of england we also know that the opportunities for uh, such um uh, leadership are very um, few and far between. And so the Church of England itself has set up its own anti-racist task force. Uh, next week, it will be coming out with a, a series of reports and they will point us to, I think what um, very clear Elisa has been telling us to do is to look at not to polarize, not to polarize, but to find practical ways that we can make a difference to meet that gospel in, in, um, imperative, to understand how all our children of God and black people are seen as the same as everyone else and should be given the same opportunities. And I think when we start, uh, I, I think when uh, earlier the conversation was when we start to accept these polarities, when we start to accept the comment that has been made that it's a problem if black people or people who support uh, these issues um, uh, call it into question, then we in some way are creating difficulties and havoc for this country. And we all need to find to have a colorblind approach where we all pretend that actually we're all the same and we, we all have equitive, equ equitable um, access to opportunities and we don't. So I, I think that we need to be absolutely clear that we are working to transform our society, that we're working for social justice and that we cannot work for social justice unless there is racial justice. And this is a key element of transformation in society. Uh, I don't, I make no apologies for it. And I'm not in the question uh, may want us to, to push towards um, pushing back on us. And I'm, I, I like my other uh, panelists say, I'm not apologizing for wanting to continue to focus on social justice and racial justice, because I think it is biblical. I think it is what Jesus came to, to, to show us and to teach us. And I think we as Christians need to keep going on the front foot in this, in this area 
and try to take people with us. Sometimes you just have to be prophetic, as we said earlier, and you cannot just accept um, a status quo that says we are colorblind and that all people um, have an equal opportunity. So I'm sorry if I went on at length, but I really do feel that questions may push us back to be defensive, and I do not want to be defensive. I want to actually say I'm very happy to continue to push towards a transformation in our society, which I think is for the good of all people, not just black people or not just white people, but all people. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Claire, uh, let me put this question to you rather than you respond to that one. And it's from Nathaniel Martin and he says this, and I think this is a more up your street. He says, how do we get black Christians into positions of power to affect system, uh, I'm sure that's mean, systemic change? Great question. Thank you. I think you said Nathaniel for that question. I think it goes back to the outworking of our theology. So I do think there is an, a slightly unhealthy sort of dichotomy between what we do, you know, in church on a Sunday, this sort of sacred secular divide and that, you know, what we do in church on a Sunday is purely spiritual, even emotional and worship, a worship experience. And then we go into the world of work and we, we're, we're, we're trying to be successful. We're trying to achieve. But actually, I think we need to 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 show how our theology is about, yes, you know, um, the saving of our souls, but also is meant to transform, it's meant to challenge. When we look at, for instance, all of the minor prophets, they were talking about God's justice. I believe that God, justice belongs to God and it's an imperative for the church to talk about. It's a, it's a conversation for the church to have. And I think that, to be honest, we've been, we've been shown up by the Black Lives Matter organization. I think they've been doing a, a great job in exposing and, and, and um, shining a light on this, this issue. So I think, the way we do this is to to be using our church spaces and church conversations having forums where we discuss this in church with a theological sort of um push behind it and then challenging our gen z challenging our millennials to go out and to, to get into politics to go out and to get into to um positions of power where they can affect change which is undergirded by christian principles and christian teaching excellent thank you and uh, that's quite succinct as well brilliant look we've got about 10 minutes left and we've got a whole heap of questions. So I'm going to put some questions uh, out there. And if you could respond as succinctly as possible, then that would be fantastic. This one is from uh, Pastor Alton Bell. And he says this, he says, as the chair of the movement for justice and reconciliation, our goal is to achieve racial reconciliation. Our remit is to achieve reconciliation by seeking reparatory justice for past wrongs. And then he says, what impact will the Sewell Report have on governments and companies who benefited greatly from the transatlantic slave trade? and who are reticent, reticent about making reparation and or taking part in the process of reparatory justice. I'm gonna put this to Wally, because I know that that's something he's passionate about. So Wally, over to you, sir. I don't think the civil report is gonna make any difference um, with regards engaging the reparatory conversation and um, precipitating a change in behavior. Um, that's not its motive. And certainly that's, that's, that's not its um, trajectory. However, I, I do think it's, it's very important that, that churches do begin to take this issue extremely seriously. And I think they can take it, take it seriously in, in two particular ways. I, I think um, it's important for, for churches to have a, a strong theological understanding and underpinning of, 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 of um, reparations. And if they don't, um, to begin to develop one as well. And then in addition to that, I also think it's very important for churches, um, having cultivated and developed that theological narrative to begin to kind of engage the, um, the government on this particular issue as well. Excellent, very uh, straight to the point. Got a question here from Reverend Dr. Ermel Kerbin. He says, as the report does not seem to recognize the difference between changing the narrative and ignoring the facts, can the panel suggest how some work could be uh, could now be done that will, on the one hand, avoid the dangers on, of unhelpful generalizations and stereotypes, and on the other, take account of the painful realities of a society that does not regard all people as equal? Uh, who wants to take that? Uh, Rosemary, you got your hand. If you could, I'm going to be really succinct. succinct. I'm going to be really succinct. Mm -hmm. There are so many reports out there, whether, you know, we, we look at just the Runnymede report, there are so many reports already. This has added nothing to the gamut of reports that have focused 
on where the challenges are, where the opportunities are, and where we can make changes and, and, and have better outcomes. I think we need to go back to what we've already got and build from those. The SOAR report gives us no platform to do that. That's what I would say. Excellent. Anyone else want to come in on that? Okay. Well, no well, just, just, just to say, I don't think that, I think we have to challenge the report's argument that there were generalizations that were made. And just to reaffirm what Rosemary has said, um, if you go, if, you know, before this report, we had the McGregor Smith report into racism in the workplace. You have the David Lammy report on the criminal justice system. You can go back to Theresa May's uh, report 2017. You can go back to previous reports. You know, there, there are 200 recommendations that were never um, um, implemented by the government. So I think it's a bit of a red herring in the document where they talk about generalizations. I think what he's trying to do there is gaslight a particular social scientific methodology, specifically, you know, critical race theory and the emphasis on narratives, autoethnographic approaches to data collection. It's really to attack that approach because that approach underlines the lived experience of people. So if you have a go at this kind of generalized lived experience, you marginalize research that then attempts to fill in the gaps which are left by a more traditional empirical approaches. Excellent, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think, well, time matches on as they say, and I'm looking at my um, uh, clock here, and I think we've got about five minutes left. So what I would like from each of you, if possible, is just to sort of sum up uh, the sort of a gist of this conversation in about 30 seconds, and particularly focusing on the churches and what the churches can do. So um, I'm looking around there. Um, uh, let me start with David and then you can all sort of uh, leap in afterwards. So David, just uh, in, in a sort of pithy way, uh, what do you think the churches, how should the churches respond to this report? Three Ps, prophetic, progressive, personal. We've got to be prophetic where we take justice seriously and we prioritize justice over reconciliation. I don't want to hear white Christians apologizing and crying. I want them to talk seriously about power, giving up some power, sharing power, but unless and until they actually do so, we're gonna have more reports. And I'm rather bored now, in any case, what I want to see is, um, is constructive action that gets to the heart of social justice from our churches. Wally, uh, next to you, sir. Well, there, there are some um, recommendations in the report. I, think, I don't think we should completely dismiss it. I think there are some recommendations in the report that we need to give um, due consideration to. Um, there's one part of the report that highlights the importance of improving the ethnicity gap in the NHS. Um, and, and there are there's, you know, there's a few other things in the report too, which I think are, are, are certainly worthy of um, in, um, given due consideration to. So I, I would say though I, I disagree with large parts of the report. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's important that, that we do delve into some of the recommendations, grapple with some of the recommendations and recognize that some of them do have um, substance and, and validity. Well, before you go, I know you're working on something. Do you want to tell us a, a few words about that in terms of how the churches can respond? What's what's this? Is I'm this about the, your racial justice advocacy forum? Oh, our, our racial, oh, that, okay. That's the racial justice advocacy. So that's... Um, that's an entity that's recently been initiated by Baptists and, and the C and CTBI. Um, what it seeks to do is to, to speak prophetically with black and brown Christians to the government on racial justice challenges um, and reparations. And it's steering group comprises of, of black and brown people from different denominations and bodies. Um, so, you know, th th these are the, the particular issues that we're grappling with now. Um, are, are very um, critical um, to the entity and we're look, looking at ways in which we can um, d develop a paper. So Alicia is actually developing, developing a paper um, um, for us, which is going to be sent to, to the churches and also um, to, to, the, to the government where it kind of critiques um, the report and suggests some very helpful recommendations to churches in terms of moving forward. Thank you for that. I thought I'd be remiss not to mention that, seeing as it's a chair. Uh, an important entity. Uh, Robert, I see you shaking your head. Yeah, three hours, really, really easy. It's all in the Bible. First of all, repent. 
because many churches and many Christian communities need to acknowledge that they've been part of the problem and not part of the solution. So they need to take that to the old rugged cross and lay it down there and start afresh. I think after they've done that, they need to move straight into radical action. The second R, and that's about redistributing resources. There are all these black organizations with brilliant young people doing incredible work and they haven't got any resource to develop it. They should be funding the work that Claire is doing with Get Real. They should be funding the work that Alicia is doing in terms of Christian education, should be funding Ben Lindsay um, and his work that he's doing with, should be funding Wale. There are all these rich evangelical churches, all these rich evangelical Christians who have never given a penny to have any black organization or project ever. It's a disgrace. So for me, if people are interested, my phone should be buzzing. I'm not taking the money. I can tell you where to send it. But if you're serious, my email box should be fixed full tomorrow with people saying, we're going to give to support these organizations. It's the second thing. Third thing then, once you've given the, the, uh, the, uh, the resources, then it's about re-educating the people. And if you've given the resources to the right people, they'll do the education for you because part of the problem has been this. The Christian church in Britain has been at the forefront of solipsism, the institutionalization of ignorance. So repent, redistribute the resources and re-educate the people. Claire Robert mentioned you just now, if you've got your 30 second. Um, sure, I would just be wary of using this report to sort of massage our consciences into thinking what well, everything's okay. You know, let's blame let's blame the victim here. I think that's my 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 warning, and I, it just reminds me. I think it's Luke eight where Jesus says, "Someone touched me," and Jesus' own disciples, thinking to what Robert just said about working together, Jesus' own disciples said, "How can you say that someone touched you, Jesus? We're all in this crowd together. How can you say that?" A bit like today, how can you say ethnic minorities are dying disproportionately because of the virus? We're all in this together we're all being affected but Jesus persisted and said somebody touched me and in the end we found a woman who was hemorrhaging for 12 years so communities have been hemorrhaging for a long time communities have been suffering let's not use this report a bit like those disciples to massage our consciences into thinking that everything's okay when it's not listen to the people who are speaking and saying that there is an issue here Yes, there's lots of data there, but I think there is a there's a there's a real way that we can can listen and interpret things slightly differently. Excellent, Alicia. Um, so many excellent things have been said. So just one simple thing: um, use this opportunity, this report, as an opportunity to reevaluate where your local chart your local church stands on these issues. Your biblical stance, your biblical case, your prophetic voice and capacity use this as an opportunity to sit down with one another and say how do we feel as a congregation a group of people not your the, the one leader everybody empower your congregations empower them to have a voice let them tell you how they feel get your surveys done know who your church is they always say it's better the devil you know it's better the jesus you know what do you understand about what the bible says about racial justice racial injustice and our response as the body of christ um, in this day and age of the 21st century. Excellent. I'm going to give Rosemary the last word. Rosemary, over to you. When this report came out, a colleague um, called me and said, does this upturn everything that we have been doing? What we've been doing is trying to put together uh, uh, an anti-racism charter, which explicitly is focused on institutional racism. So I just want to say, I said, no, we continue to do what we had intentionally set out to do, which is to focus all our studies, our liturgy, our teaching, our prayer, our word, our work, and our actions to take strategic and practical actions to combat racism and racial inequality, because that's what the gospel calls us to do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosemary. And I'd like to say a big thank you uh, to uh, all our panelists. I'm sure that out there in Zoom land, uh, you, uh, like me, have been inspired and encouraged and challenged in equal measure uh, by what you have heard this evening. So I'd like to thank our speakers once again. I'd like to thank uh, uh, our uh, attendees who uh, forfeited uh, a, a Champions League football match this evening. So I've been told to join us. I'm sure what you've heard is far better, it's far more inspiring than anything Manchester City would be doing this evening. I'd like to thank my colleague, Mike, who has done all the uh, technical wizardry behind the scenes. Well done, Mike, thanks for that. Uh, before we go, uh, I'd just like to mention to you uh, a few things that uh, our organization, CGBI, are doing. Uh, 
in uh, later this month where the Church of Refugee Network, which is a program of uh, CTBI, will be hosting a meeting looking at the asylum system. Uh, and what we will be saying is, can it be improved? Is there such a thing as an ethical or a Christian uh, asylum system? Uh, please feel free to look at the CTBI website to find out more information about that. And it'd be great to see you join us. Also like to talk about a, uh, another webinar that we will be hosting on the 5th of May, 2021, which is called Black, actually it's called Blue is the Colour, and it will be looking at the police and the police's engagement with uh, diverse communities, both in England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. And again, please look at the CTBI website uh, for more information. And then finally, uh, CTBI is working with a number of churches in Britain and Ireland, and also quite a few people who are with us uh, on, on the panel to organize a service marking the first anniversary of the killing of George Floyd. This service is going to take place at the New Testament Church of God in Brixton, uh, and it will be available uh, to view on YouTube and later on the BBC in terms of BBC Radio 4 will be broadcasting that. But please do look at the CTBI website uh, to find more information about that. It'd be great if you could join us to uh, mark um, a, such a, a significant anniversary that sort of talks about all the issues that we've been discussing this evening, particularly issues to do with uh, justice, uh, equity, um, and uh, decency, and uh, the value of human life. So just like to once again thank the panel and thank you and to say good evening, uh, stay safe, uh, be good, and if you can't be good, be careful. Good night.